So Paul, we just outlined our second potential test that we can kind of see these waves, these modes moving through the sun. But if we're really going to see this, this changing size, this changing surface uh, at great detail, we really have to essentially observe the sun every single minute. Now, we know we can't do that, right? The Earth spins, yes. we have daytime and nighttime. The sun is big, so these waves are going to take a long time to bounce back and forth. So you need to observe the sun for days, weeks, months, years, constantly. Um, and any one place on Earth, you can't observe the sun constantly for large periods of time. Yep. But people were thinking back in the early 20th century, well, you, we know the sun never sets on the British Empire. <laughs> um, and in fact, that's what our own that's place right. of work, Mount Stromlo Observatory, was set up to be one of a network all around the British Empire. That could and this included the, the Americas. The Americans forget they were a US air colony at one point. <laughs> yes, and they uh, had telescopes all around the world that could observe the sun constantly. Now, this wasn't doing helio seismology, yep. the seismic waves in the sun. But more recently, there are networks of telescopes yep. around the world. Um, there's the Bison Network, for example, which have telescopes scattered at observatories all around the world. And basically, when the sun sets at one, they start at the next one. And they can measure these either changes in the Doppler effect, the shift of the surface of the sun, or the changes in the brightness of different layers of the sun. And this sort of technique is actually common across lots of areas of astronomy now, using that geographical option to do continuous monitoring. And the sun's a great place. But more recently, there's an even better way to do it, which is to put your, your telescope in space where it can just stare at the sun constantly without worrying about these day and night and clouds and things like this. Yeah, look, these are all those things astronomers hate, so satellites in that case solve yep. that problem. So they have the spacecraft SOHO and now the SDO yep. spacecraft, which are now for decades have been staring pretty much constantly at the sun. Taking continuous images for decades. Yes, and they indeed see these vibrations. Okay. And you can take the signal and play it as sound. So this is actually the sound of the vibrations of the sun as measured by the spacecraft. Enormously speeded up. The real frequencies are much too low for the human ear to hear. Yeah. This could be like years of data. So this is kind of like when you would stri uh, strung that guitar string that we were looking at the frequencies. This is those waves, those modes moving through it. Yep. So that's the sound, but a more interesting way to plot it is graphically. Okay. What we plot here is angular degree. This is um, how small the components are. A high angular degree is components like a degree of 250. You mean they're 250 waves across the surface of the sun. Yeah, which um, is a lot. So those would be short wavelength. Yep. And the short wavelength ones will penetrate to any more shallow depths in the sun, whereas the longer wavelength ones, they might only be 50 or 100 across the surface of the sun, are penetrating deeper. So you can look at the different degrees to figure out the different depths. And this is the frequency of all these waves in millihertz, so mm -hmm. very low frequencies, <laughs> thousandth of a cycle per second. So one cycle every one millihertz would be one cycle every thousand seconds, which is so, like 20 minutes. So we're not going to be hearing this. Not until we speed them up a lot. And what you can see is this quite beautiful stripey pattern. Yeah, there's this string things that there's these patterns that as you go at different angular degrees, as the different modes and really different depths here, you get structure. So there's a lot of data here. So your model has to explain the frequency of every one of these lines at every different angular speed and how strong they are. And yeah, and you know, these, these lines curve, they, ch they choose their density. So there's, yeah, as you said, there's a lot of data here to describe by my our model, so we've, got, we've suddenly got a new mega constraint. Yeah, this is kind of more than the previous five we started with. <laughs> we've got to have the right speed of sound and the right density at, at every depth within the sun. Actually, it turns out it, does, it doesn't tell you very much about the core of the sun okay. because very few of the waves go deep enough to penetrate that. But all the layers above the core, the radiative zone, the convection zone, they all have to have the right density and temperature to match all these lines. And how does it do? Well, if you're from a recent review paper, this is the speed of sound and okay. how accurate it is. So if it was zero, our models would perfectly match what you get from all these oscillations. Okay. And it's not spot on. Nope. If you look at the scale, 0 0.005, it's accurate to within half a percent. That's not bad for a given how detailed it is. Yeah, and the, and the density is not quite so good, but it's still accurate to within 2% or 1%, depending on what exact measurement you're trying to make. Uh and I guess when you look at it, there also doesn't appear to be kind of this big shift or bias, right? We get some that we've kind of, you know, we're below, some we're above. So 
We're kind of yeah. right in the middle there. And our models are pretty simple. I mean, the things yeah. that actually mean models are not perfect are, for example, that some of the heavy elements, instead of being uniformly spread, are actually sinking slowly towards the center. So the density of the sun is not quite what you'd expect. Also, the convection tends to overshoot a bit. Okay. Instead of staying nice within its convective zone, sometimes it pops up a bit below and above. And there are all sorts of these complications that are really hard to model. But nonetheless, it's a spectacularly good agreement within you, a percent or so throughout the sun. Well, and as you said, even as you said before, though, even though there's complications and difficulties and it's not quite perfect, it's telling us a whole lot of new things that we wouldn't have been able to test had it not shown it. So what do you think? We've got our model of the sun. We've seen our five constraints. We've seen the neutrinos. We've seen the uh, helioseismology, the vibrations. Are you inclined to believe it now? I'm getting a lot closer than the five initial constraints. I mean, if you wanted to come up with a rival theory for how the sun worked, let's say you're a creationist and you want it to be much younger or something like this, that's a lot of data you have to fit very well. And more importantly, these were also predicted before. We're not fitting a new model to this. Our model already existed. We came up with a new test and then it said, hey, you know what? You guys did a not too bad job. So I'm, yeah, I think this is now looking pretty good. I think we can, with our hand on our heart, say that we can model the interior of the sun. It's not 100% accurate everywhere, but the big picture, I think, is... To 99%, we're probably there. All the way through, and there's so much data that fit it, it'd be really hard to come up with a rival model that came anywhere near as close. Sounds good.